during his service the work as a director in a judicial officer training institute at nagpur after establishment of judicial academy at uttan sir was appointed as a joint director sir retired in the month of may 2011 sir worked as a judicial officer for 17 years after retirement also sir is providing guidance to all the practicing advocates as well as the candidates who are appearing for judicial exams today's topic assigned to sir is art of writing civil judgments now i request kd patil sir to start his lecture i welcome you sir over to you sir thank you madam <coughs> at outset i wish all of you hello yes sir uh, you proceed sir i wish all of you happy ganesh chaturthi now tomorrow is the ganesh chaturthi i wish all the participants success in the interesting examination for the post of civil judge unit division and judicial magistrate first class the subject given to me to speak before the learned law students that is the advocates is the art of writing civil judgments i have gone through the past papers of the civil judge unit division jmc examination and i found that 20 marks have been given to writing of civil judgment of the total marks of 100 and just one fifth of the 100 marks have been given to the writing of civil judgment <coughs> civil judgment is required to be written on the basis of the substantive law substantive law speaks about the rights duties and liabilities and for the implementation of the civil uh, substantive laws there are procedural laws that is for the purpose of civil matters code of civil procedure and evidence act evidence act is also the procedural law you must be knowing that the evidence act is very important and in view of the evidence act a fact is required to be proved the fact means the fact in issue and relevant fact and the fact is required to be proved in view of the definitions of the proved disproved and proved given in section 3 of the evidence act a fact is the one which can be pursued by the senses there are five senses mouth that way can be test because one can test it by the tongue eyes one can see by eyes one can hear to by ears one can smell by nostrils and we can and the one can understand something by touching these are the five <coughs> aspects in respect of perception but there are one more thing that is internal fact that is knowledge or fear greed that that is required to be inferred in view of the evidence because that is not tangible that is intangible other things are tangible tangible and which can be touched which can be seen an intangible which cannot be seen which are invisible and that's why in respect of those facts which are intangible evidence is required required to be scrutinized to <coughs> infer whether that fact exists or does not exist the standard of proof is the most important thing for the purpose of arriving at facts finding and the standard of proof for the purpose of civil matter is on the basis of preponderance of probability if the if you a prudent man feels that particular fact exists that it that is required it is required to hail that the fact has been proved if the prudent man feels that the fact does not exist then you have to hold that the fact is not proved that is disproved that we will find in the definition of the proved disproved and not proved given in section 3 of the evidence act <coughs> with this i will refer to the question mark papers wherein some notes have been given for writing of the judgment on civil side one thing first if notice 
frame proper issues on the basis of pleadings of parties. Framing of issues is the most important. I'll come to that later on how the issues are to be framed. Second note is adhere to the contents of the judgment as required by the code of civil procedure. Contents of the, what are the contents of the judgment? You will find in order, order 20, rule 4 of CPC. Third note is wherever necessary, you may exercise discretion in filling up details while appreciating evidence in the judgment. That means there is scope for your imagination. Because what happened the, the plaintiff's case and the defendant's defense have been given, are given in the question paper, and there is scope for your imagination because the sometimes what happened, who are the witnesses examined by the plaintiff and who are the witnesses examined by the defendants, they are you will not get in the question paper. That's why there is scope for imagination. And while arriving at the facts finding, you have to give reasons. Reason without reasons, the facts finding will be of no use. The reasons should be based on logic, logic, and that reasons should be legal and proper one. And that these are the four notes you will get in the question paper, and the notes are in view of the provisions of the evidence act also. <coughs> While writing the judgment, you should first carefully go through the case of the plaintiff and the defense of the defendant, which you will find in the question paper. The, on the basis of <coughs> the case of the plaintiff, you can gather what relief he has sought and how the defendant has contested the suit. And from that, from these pleadings, pleadings means plaint plus return statement, you will come, you can gather what is the nature of the suit. What is the nature of the suit? And that nature of the suit, you have to write in the opening pair of your judgment, opening pair of. For example, this is a suit for perpetual injunction, restraining the defendant from causing obstruction to the plaintiff's possession over the suit aggregates land. Or this is a suit for specific performance of agreement for sale. Or this is a suit for recovery of money on the basis of promissory note. Or this is a suit for recovery of unpaid price under section 55 of the sale of goods act. Like this, there are uh, uh, Various suits, there are suits are also under the Specific Relief Act 1963. The Section 5 is the general suit for possession of immobile property. And Section 6 is the summary suit for possession of immobile property. Section 7 and 8 are in respect of possession of movable property. Wherever necessary, you may refer to the section if you are definite that section is correct if you are uh, uh, remembering otherwise don't refer to the section that this is the first para what is the first para you have to mention that the nature of the suit nature of the suit and the second para is the plaintiff's case in short so what happens don't write for, uh, uh, that uh, the, the in view of the plaint or in of the uh, uh, case pleaded by the plaintiff in the plaint, his case is what is the necessity to write that in view of the pleading of the plaintiff in the plaint, plaint, pleading, plaintiff's pleading is always in the plaint. That's why don't write this with these words. These are superfluous. Go on writing engagement. Shortly stated, the plaintiff's case is that and write down what is given in the paper. Then third para, third para is the defense of the defendant. The defendant defends in of the return statement. The defendant's suit summons was served on the defendant and he appeared and filed the return statement. What is the necessity of means writing all these things? When the defendant files the suit or files the return statement, that means he has appeared in the suit. That's why it is not necessary to mention that the suit was served summons was issued, it was served upon the defendant, he appeared and he filed the return. See how much time will be consumed while writing this. And these are a totally superfluous thing. Just a, you may write the, in, the defendant by return statement at a file that is so and so, contested the suit contending in Australia that and write what is given in your question paper. Then the fourth para is very important. 
that is in respect of the framing of issues. You have to frame the issues in view of the pleading of the plaintiff given in the question paper and the defense of the defendant given in the question paper. And while framing the issue, we should have regard to the to chapter seven of the Evidence Act that speaks about burden of proof. The, on whom the burden is to prove the issue that should appear from the form of the issue which you are going to frame in the question paper. For example, does the plaintiff prove that he is the owner of the suit property? Or if there are more plaintiffs than one, do the plaintiffs prove that they are the owners of the suit property? Or whether the plaintiffs are the owners of the suit property? If there is only one plaintiff, whether the plaintiff, uh, uh, whether the whether the plaintiff proves that he is the owner of the suit property, or whether the defendants prove that they are the owners of the suit property, like this, the, you should frame the issue. Word proof generally appear should appear in the form of the issue. For this purpose, I would like to invite your attention to the distinction between to the distinction between burden of proof and onus of proof. You will not find what is mean by onus of proof in the Evidence Act. In chapter 7 of the Evidence Act speaks about the burden of proof. But onus of proof is quite different from burden of proof. Burden of proof is always stationary in civil suit and also in a criminal case also. Always stationary. Suppose the burden of proof in view of the issue frame is on the plaintiff or the defendant. It is for the plaintiff or the defendant to prove that issue on the basis of the preponderance of probability. But sometimes what happens, the evidence is the continuous process. Suppose the plaintiff is being examined and he is also is being cross-examined. There is continuous process of shifting of onus of proof. What shifts is the onus of proof that does not, what shifts is not the burden of proof. That's why oh, shifting of onus of proof whether when the plaintiff was being examined or the witnesses were being examined or when the defendant was being examined or when the defense witnesses were examined, it is a continuous process. And on the basis of this continuous process, you have to conclude whether a fact in your the issue frame is proved or not proved or disproved. Okay, and that's why you should record the finding against the issue. Yes, if proved, yes. If not proved, no. Or otherwise, if proved, right finding, proved, and if not proved, mention again the issue, not proved or disproved. Disproved means totally false. Not proved means the defendant has failed or plaintiff has failed to prove the issue. Maybe, maybe uh, he, he has failed because of some lacuny in the evidence or the pleading like this. This is the, the, in this way, there should be the issues which you are required to frame in your answer paper, answer sheet. Then, after finding there are reasons, there is, judgment is not complete without reasons. Now, before you, while writing the judgment in on the basis of the uh, plaintiff's case and defendant's case provided to in the question paper, you have to imagine particular witnesses are examined or depend or particular witnesses examined by the plaintiff and particular witnesses are examined by the defendant. And you have to mention that plaintiff after the uh, finding uh, is framing issues, the next para reasons below that plaintiff has examined himself as PW1 at exhibit so and so. And in addition, he has examined his witnesses PW2, PW3, PW4 like this. Don't write the names of the witnesses because they see the instruction given at the top of your question paper. That because your identity should not be disclosed on the in of the your answer sheet provided to you. Just mention PW1, PW2, PW3, that's why any and at exhibit so and so. Like the defendant has examined to contain the suit himself as DW1 and addition and in addition to his witnesses, DW2, DW3, DW4, like this. But whenever you are going multiplying the number of witnesses, you have to refer to the evidence of those witnesses while writing the judgment. That's why you should be very careful to see that the witnesses examined by the plaintiff and the defendant are less. That will save your time. Okay. 
then after the witness is examined then next para you may write what are the documents produced and proved by the plaintiff and what are the documents produced and proved by the defendant of, of course you may imagine on the basis of the evidence these are the documents proved then issue number 1 issue one. you have to frame the issue in the sequence you have to arrange the issues in sequence like well, one is going to unfold a story well, while reading your judgment the reader should understand really what you are going to convey otherwise what happens the, uh, the reader will get perplexed puzzled that's why reader you should be very careful to see that the reader of your judgment should not be puzzled you should easily understand that you are going to writing a judgment like unfolding of a story okay the first issue then you have to discuss that issue for example now take a suit <coughs> for specific performance of the contract that falls under the specific relief act 1963 that what are the different possible defenses for the uh, in the suit for specific performance of contract the defenses are taken by the defendant the defendant may that the, there is no concluded agreement for sale or the document styled as agreement sale is in fact is not the agreement for sale but is a document of money transaction that loan was borrowed and for the loan borrowed the at the insistence of the plaintiff the defendant executed the agreement for sale this is this is in the spirit of undue influence under the contract act the agreement for sale is nothing but a contract is a contract and what are the uh, how it, uh, uh, what are the defenses can be taken in your the contract to say that the contract is not concluded the five things fraud coercion undue influence misrepresentation like this five you have to take one of them And when the defenses of money lending, then that is a undue influence because the defendant was the need was in need of money for the purpose of some urgency to meet the marriage of his daughter, son, or to education to meet the expense of the education of son or daughter, or to meet the bill of the medical expense of some one of the family members like this. And accordingly, the defendant has to clear the case. And and produce the evidence, and that basis we may come to the conclusion that whether the agreement for sale is an out and out agreement for sale, or whether it is a document for a document in respect of a money transaction, like this. That these differences you may take in your section nine of the specific relief act. So the relief act quite quite clear on this point. Even after amendment to the specific relief act in the 2018. There is no uh, change in section nine of the special relief act. <coughs> that in the same suit, not specific perform contract whether the plaintiff is ready and willing to perform his part of the contract. That is in your section sixteen of the uh, uh, special relief act. Before the amendment of two thousand eighteen, it was necessary for the plaintiff to aver and prove, to plead and prove. now the word plead or aver has been omitted from the section 16c after the amendment of 2018 and word is only with the plenty proves he is ready and willing to perform his part of the contract what happened there are, even when <coughs> before the amendment to 18 even of the judgments of the supreme court it was not necessary that there should be actual words that words that words in the plain that plenty He is ready and willing to perform his part of the contract. But what whether readiness and willingness of plenty is to be gathered from the overall averments made in the plan. This is what the Supreme Court has said, and that might have been prompted to the legis parliament to delete the word aver or prove. But anyhow, when the other the plenty proves that he is ready and willing to perform his part of the contract, he is part of the contract. What is the part of this contract? He has paid the part amount of the consideration, remaining amount of consideration, balance amount of consideration. He is all the way. Of, he was ready and willing to pay 
but it was the defendant who was not accepting the money and executing the sale deal like this. And on the EPC, the plaintiff would prove the a plaintiff will examine himself and his witnesses. Witnesses means attesting witness if any or scribe of that agreement for sale like this. The, <clears throat> and that document is proved or not, that is to be seen in view of the provisions of the evidence act. Section 67 of the evidence act speaks as to how a such document is to be proved. For that purpose, signature and writing of the executant is required to be proved. And the scribe is the most important in such a case because the scribe will tell as to that the, both the parties approached him, narrated their cases, and as per their instruction, he has scribed the agreement for sale. He read over the agreement for sale to them. They admitted the contents, and thereafter they sign the agreement for sale. Any addition witnesses also sign the agreement for sale. If this is the evidence and the witnesses stand to the test of cross examination, then the plaintiff's case has to be accepted. See section 9, 10 of the special report. From oral reading of those sections, you will find that generally and ordinarily, a suit for specific performance of contract is required to be dictated. Even the Supreme Court has also held accordingly in AR 1979 Supreme Court. That, that the face of the defendant is required to be considered. Okay, because before the amendment, there was discretion to the court whether to uh, decree the suit or not. But after the amendment, that discretion has been taken away. <coughs> and that's why it is for you to consider the after amendment, what has been inserted in this special relief act. Then take the second suit, suit for injunction. The suit for perpetual injunction is governed by section 38 of the Special Relief Act. Special Relief Act is of 1963. Section 38 is divided into three parts. That is subsection 1, subsection 2, and subsection 3. Subsection 1 is speaks about, subsection 1 speaks about an obligation existing in favor of the plaintiff, breach of which is committed by the defendant. And their obligation is either express or implied. Subject to, there is a breach of contract committed by the defendant, committed by the defendant. And third is, when the defendant, very third, subsection three is very important. Majority of the suits for purpose in jail relating to the immobile property fall under subsection three of section 38. I am reading section 3, very important. You, if you have got the book, you may also read along with me. Section 3. When the defendant invades or threatens to invade the plaintiff's right to or enjoyment of property. See, there are commas. When the plaintiff invades, comma, or threatens to invade the plaintiff's right to, comma, or enjoyment of, comma, property, comma. That means this subsection 3 has been divided into four parts. Four parts. One, when the defendant invades the plaintiff's right to property. One thing, middle words I am omitting to show that the subsection 3 speaks about four parts. Second part, when the defendant invades the plaintiff's enjoyment of property. Here, right, I am not, I have not read it. I omitted it. The third, when the defendant threatens to invade the plaintiff's right to property, here threaten. First, invades. Already there is invasion, there is corruption, and now threatens. Threatens to invade, that there is no invasion. And the fourth one is the defendant threatens the plaintiff's enjoyment of property. Fourth one. Now see whether the plaintiff is the owner of the sole property or whether the defender is the owner of the suit property. And you record the finding that the plaintiff is not the owner of the suit property, but the defendant is the owner of the suit property. The next question would be whether the plaintiff was in possession of the suit property on the date of the suit. This is the most question, important question. And if you find that the plaintiff was in possession of the suit property on the date of the suit, and his possession is settled, his possession is settled effective 
to the knowledge of the defender the defender did not take any action when the plaintiff was taking forcible possession and as such when the plaintiff is in settled position that he is entitled to injunction against the defendant even though defendant is the true owner it is for the defendant then to file a suit for possession under section 5 of the special relief act that's why there is one judgment of the supreme court on this point three judgments of the supreme court rame gowda versus vardappa naidu 2004 volume 1 supreme court case 769 because in india there is a rule of law or supreme court says in india in india there is rule of law no one can take the law in his own hand now suppose that the suit is for possession simpliciter of the emerald property and that suit based on title what i say based on title is covered by section 5 of the special relief act if such a suit is before you you may and in the first pair of your judgment write that this is suit for possession based on title in your section 5 of the special relief act this will show that you have studied the provisions of law very carefully you know under which provision the suit is and the suit is whether on the basis of title or possessory title both the suits are covered by section 5 section 5 of the special relief act title is one thing and possessory title means actually he is not the owner but he is in possessory position but he has been dispossessed by the defendant who is not the true owner who is not the true owner that means if the suit is on the basis of possessory title under section 5 none of the plaintiff and the defendant is the true owner the true owner is the different one he is not party to the suit but the defendant has possibly dispossessed the plaintiff without following due process of law that's why such a plaintiff can institute a suit for possession against the defendant who has possibly evicted him okay and if suppose the true owner has dispossessed the plaintiff without following due process of law possibly dispossessed the plaintiff the plaintiff was the trespasser or person in unauthorized possession the defendant was the true owner without approaching the court the defendant possibly dispossessed such plaintiff that the plaintiff may bring the suit for possession again the true owner and that suit falls under section 6 of the special relief act not under section 5 of 6 of the special relief act and for such a suit the limitation period is of 6 months and the limitation period has been given in section 6 of the special relief act itself and such a suit is called as a summary suit why summary was appeal lies to the district to of the up six month the appeal does not lie against the judgment of civil court under section 6 but what lies is the revision right yes i am i am reading section 3 of section 6 no appeal shall lie from any order decree passed in any suit instituted under this section that means the decree which will be passed by you would is not appealable is not appealable that's why you should try to know i know the facts of the case given to you in the question paper whether the suit is under section 5 or under section 6 of the special relief act okay i think you understand it like this section 7 and 8 the suit for possession of movable property movable property that suppose the suit is for partition and separate possession the suit is for partition and separate possession the plaintiff's case and defendant's case are given in the question paper for your perusal and for writing judgment and on that basis you may frame the issue and the question is the plaintiff and defendant are the brothers theirs is the ancestral property there is one more property which is in the name of the defendant only now the question would be whether the plaintiff has one half share in the suit property suit property means ancestral property plus one plus the property which has been purchased in the name of the defendant 
where the defendant comes with the comes with the case that he has purchased the that property with his own money that is a self acquired property see that under the hindu law there is presumption of joint family but there is no presumption of joint hindu there is no joint family property these words should appear in your judgment there is presumption of hindu joint family but there is no presumption of hindu joint family property okay here i say joint family property i did not say ancestral property see the distinction between ancestral property and joint family property ancestral property is the one which descends down from father or father's father means grandfather or father's father's father means great grandfather why it is said father or father's father why not grandfather because this is in the line about the father not mother or mother's father is also grandfather that's the word grandfather is not there that's why the words are father father's father father's father's father that means in the line of father not in the line of mother okay and that property when it comes down to the plaintiff and dependent then that property is their ancestral property and thereafter with the help of the income received from the ancestral property with the income received from the ancestral property as a property the shares or the co-partner purchase a property in the name of anyone for example in the name of defender in such a case the question would be the issue would be whether the particular property mentioned which is which has been purchased in the name of the defendant whether that property survey number so and so or cts number so and so is the joint family property of the plaintiff and defendant see joint family we don't say ancestral property that's why first i have brought to your notice what is the distinction between ancestral property and joint family property ancestral property is the one which comes down from father father's father or father's father's father and joint family property means ancestral property and the property which is purchased from the income of the ancestral property that that is ancestral property per purchased property equivalent to joint family property that is the purchased property the joint family property that's why that purchased the purchased property is the joint family property this would be issue proper issue If we say that the purchased property is the ancestral property, then there will be mistake which we will be going to commit. Avoid such mistake because that will speak about your legal notions. If your legal notions are clear, then such mistake will not appear while framing the issue. Okay. Then while deciding the under which of the evidence whether the purchased property is the joint family property or not, regard must be had to the nucleus. nucleus means the proper ancestral property income from the ancestral property was sufficient to purchase that property at the time when that property was purchased then owners shifts upon the defendant i say owners burden i do not say burden of proof burden of proof is always stationary and owners of proof is always fluctuating like pendulum of a wall clock that is a continuous process for the proto i would like to invite your attention to the supreme court decision in raghavamma versus chenchama raghavamma versus chenchama reported ar 1964 supreme court 136 and also there is one judgment of our high court also on this point ar 1976 bombay page 315 this speaks this both the decisions on the point and the point of distinction between burden of proof and onus of proof and in both the cases it has held that burden of proof is always stationary and onus of proof always fluctuates like pendulum of a wall clock wall clock like this but then it is for the defendant to show that he purchased because onus shifts upon the defendant when the plaintiff produces the evidence that there was sufficient nucleus from the ancestral properties so as to purchase that new property then ownership is upon the defendant you have to write the ownership i don't say ownership of proof ships while writing judgment you should be very careful while using the proofs the proper word should be used by you 
the onus of seems upon the defendant the defendant it is for the defendant to show that they he had sufficient money when the property was purchased or purchase of that property and as to how he has paid that money from his own pocket and that evidence of the defendant should be to your satisfaction your satisfaction means you you as a civil judge satisfaction why i say your satisfaction because you when you will be sitting on dais as the civil judge you will be a better or best prudent man to appreciate the evidence i say prudent man why i say prudent man section 3 of the evidence act says section 3 of the evidence act defines three words prude disprove and not prove see the word i am definition of prude i am reading a fact is said to be proved when after considering the matters before it now what is matters the word is not evidence matter means evidence plus demeanor of the witnesses matters means evidence plus demeanor of the witnesses before it the court either believes it to exist or considers its existence so probable that a prudent man what is prudent man a judicious minded person man ought under the circumstances of a particular case to act upon the supposition that it has exist and the disproved that the words are in negative form does not exist like this this must just that means the fine fact finding is to record it from the view point of a prudent man that should appeal to the common sense your reasons should appeal to the common sense common sense <clears throat> and like this you have to go on appreciate the evidence the evidence is to be is to be considered from imagination because the evidence is not given in the question paper you have to imagine and take the risk for imagination and according there is note in the question paper Yeah, well, uh, well, one more suit. Suppose the defendant went to the plaintiff's shop to purchase some articles, and he purchased the articles on credit. On credit, but the defendant, but the plaintiff doesn't make the payment of that credit amount of that uh, amount. despite demand by the defendant then this de then the plaintiff uh, 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 sorry defendant purchased the property uh, some articles on credit from the plaintiff shop but the defendant does not make the payment thereof despite the plaintiff makes demand of that amount of money then the plaintiff institutes the suit for recovery of that unpaid price what is unpaid price that you will find in section 55 of the sale of goods act why i am referring to this case petla because your subject a uh, civil civil subject a uh, civil paper speaks about acts civil procedure court transfer of property act special relief act law of contract sale of goods and partner sale of goods act this suit falls under section 55 of the sale of goods act that's the first pair of such suit should be this is suit for recovery of amount of so and so as unpaid price unpaid price of so and so under section 55 of the sale of goods act that means the reader of your judgment will definitely understand that you all well conversant with the provisions of the sale of goods act okay but then like this again plaintiff's case in short then defendant defense in short they frame the issues see the defense of the plaintiff a uh, defendant plaintiff say plaintiff for the plaintiff to show whether the defendant has purchased the so and such goods on credit or uh, goods worth to pay so on credit from his shop then whether the the, the uh, defendant uh, uh, failed to make the payment despite demand by the made by the plaintiff the defense of the defendant is that the whether the defendant proves that he did not purchase the property like this and then you go on appreciating the pleading evidence in the light of the pleading evidence should be in consonance with pleading evidence which is not preceded by pleading <coughs> is of no use this is the settled rule of law that one more example there 
what happens i have to take the example i have gone through the past question papers and from those question papers i have found the judgments which you are the, you were asked to right now one more question now this is of 2011 this is suit for possession of encroached land encroached land plaintiffs and defendants lands are adjoining to each other adjoining to each other plaintiff got measured both the lands his land and the defendants land through the pi lot taluka inspector of land records or district inspector of land records and after the measurement it was found that the defendant has encroached upon some gunta the some are of land from the plaintiff's land suppose five gunta or 10 gunta of land from the plaintiff land the plaintiff asked the defendant to deliver back the encroached land but the defendant refused defendant said that he did not encroach that is his land that land is from his survey number any addition in the alternative if he has if there is encroachment he has become owner of that encroached land by his position since <coughs> that land is in his possession from more than 50 years 30 years 25 years like this that is beyond the period of 12 years as is required by article 65 of the limitation act <coughs> now in such case it is for the plaintiff to examine himself and to examine the surveyor who has measured the land the map is also produced that is exhibited you have to write like this the defendant also examine that measurement is not legal they are not according to the survey rules there is such such mistakes in the measurement and the measurement being faulty the encroachment shown by the uh, surveyor is not correct like this and in alternative if there is encroachment then the defendant is in possession of this land for more than 12 years he has become owner by adverse possession <coughs> now you go on assessing the evidence of the plaintiff and mostly that surveyor surveyor you is the most important witness in this such a case and see whether the his evidence the yeah, measurement is in view of the survey rules what survey rules say 15 days notice is required to issue to all the adjacent land holders then tipan uttara is required to be taken and the bishop to tipan uttara at least two fixed boundaries are required to be located of each land plaintiff land and defendant land that is survey rule and on the basis of the tipan uttara and the fixed boundaries the lands are measured and then survey finds whether there is encroachment or not and if the surveyor find that there is encroachment then he accordingly puts it in the map drawn by him and the measurement is carried in presence of the punch witness also some punch is taken two punch is taken and that measurement map is not a public document he is not a public document but is it is a document it is a this measurement map is drawn for the purpose of plaintiff's application and that's why you have to refer to section 30 for you of the evidence that relevant shop entry in the public record this is not applicable because why because this this section 30 for you and section 84 of the evidence chart a section 84 presumption as to collection of law the report of precision oh, sorry 83 83 now you have to discuss the section 30 for you and 83 in short 30 for you means when there is a general survey of in the village and the general survey is carried out after issuing public notices and notices to individuals in the village because in the village earlier there is no survey when the uh, during british india 
Yeah, all the almost all the lands in the India were surveyed by the British government, and some of the lands were got measured thereafter. And after the lands were surveyed and certain numbers were given, given during the British government, then in view of the prevention of fragmentation and consolidation holdings, that again the lands are measured and then gut numbers are given. Certain numbers are changed, and at the place of certain number, gut numbers are given. For two certain numbers, one gut number is given. Or one certain number divided into two gut numbers like this, but such at that time tipan uttara are taken on the basis of the tipan uttara and that survey for initial survey or in view of the prevention of fragmentation and preservation of holdings that the survey was carried out. But the record or the maps drawn are admissible being public document in your thirty five of the Odisha. But when there is a case of enforcement, when there is a case of enforcement, when somebody applies for measurement, appreh apprehending that there is an enforcement, that means that measurement is carried out for the purpose of cause of the plenty. I am reading section C eighty three, cause of the plenty, and that's why the map drawn by surveyor on in view of the application made by the plenty is not a public document. And that's why that is required to be proved as a already as an ordinary document in view of the rules of the evidence side. And once that is proved, then enforcement located, then burden of proof on the <coughs> plaintiff stands discharged. Then burden, then burden of proof lies upon the defendant. I say burden of proof. Why? The defence of the defendant is that he has become owner by adoption. That's a burden lies upon the defendant to prove that now prove that he has become owner of that enclosed land by adoption. Now what is land by adoption? That's so you will get in section 10, uh, article six sixty five of the Limitation Act. Read with section twenty seven of the Limitation Act. Adoption uh, law in this regard adoption is not concluded only by reference to article sixty five, but Along with Article 65, you have to refer to Section 27 of the Evidence Act. Okay, because by way of adverse position, one loses his title and second gets title. What limitation act is limitation act is for the purpose of approaching the court within the period of limitation. That means they doesn't approach the particular person in the court to the court that he loses his remedy. He doesn't lose his right. To the property, but so far as the adoption is concerned, acquisition of ownership on the basis of adoption is concerned, there is departure from this rule. That right is lost, and that right is lost in your section twenty seven of the Evidence Act. That means ownership of the plaintiff will be lost, provided the defendant proves that he has become owner by adoption, and the defendant would become owner, and defendant become owner, and such a declaration. Is given by the court, and then defendant becomes the owner. The plaintiff suit for possession of enclosed land he is liable to be dismissed. If the defendant fails to prove that he has become owner by adoption, the plaintiff suit for possession of the enclosed land he is required to be decreed with cost. Okay. With this, yeah, because there are, I mean, some instances I have given in view of the. Keep transfer of property, especially required law of contract, sale of goods, and partnership act. Partnership act will suit is for dissolution of partnership firm and accounts. Whether the partnership firm is registered or not registered, that is also required to be considered for the purpose of section sixty nine of the partnership act. Like this, whether the partnership should dissolve after death of particular partner. What are the contents of the partnership deed? They are required to be gone through. You have to imagine what are the contents of the partnership deed, and then on that basis you have to go on discussing the evidence and then conclude to record finding on particular issue. Okay. Now suppose the transfer of property, the so transfer of property there are uh, transfer, sale is the transfer, mortgage is the transfer, lease is the transfer. Exchange is the transfer. Gift is the transfer. There are such six transfers are contemplated by the property act. 
then also other sections also but there is one more section which speaks about oral transfer that is section 9 of the transfer of property act what is it mean by what does it mean oral transfer as contemplated by section 9 of the transfer of property act you must have read that particular person has surrendered his right to the property in the name of second person suppose the plaintiff is a dependent or the <coughs> the suit is for plaintiff brings the suit for possession of the particular viable property under section 5 of the special deed act the defendant say contending that the defendant has it was the property of the defendant and the defendant has surrendered his right in my favor by executing the registered surrender deed extinguishment deed and i have become the owner but the defendant is causing the obstruction and that prevent him from causing obstruction by grant of perpetual injunction under section 38 of the special deed act 383 of the special deed act now That there is counter claim of the defendant that surrender I am not surrender by surrender that surrender is not valid legal and valid and that's why he seeks possession in view of the counter claim. Who can surrender the property? Who can extinguish his property? This is the most important because. I have seen many illegal extinguished deeds, surrender deeds are produced in the court to get relief. You should be very cautious while dealing with such matters. Section nine is applicable under certain certain circumstances, and I say. that surrender of property is by a co-partner only who has interest in the co-partner property who has interest in the ancestral property but once the shares are defined shares are crystallized they there she is not interest in the property but there she have the shares in the property definite share but interest is not definite that is liable to be increased or decreased increased because of birth of a co-partner decreased because of death of a co-partner that means this fluctuating part is called as interest that is not shares and shares are definite and when shares are there one sharer even the property is not partitioned or not partitioned by mids and bound that property cannot be surrendered he may sell it he may gift it but cannot be transferred by surrender deed and that surrender deed totally illegal and invalid and that which is no relief can be granted in the case law you will get also on this point recent case also or bombay high court also judgment is also on there i i could not get it but i have read it just before few months you know abr yeah. but such thing liable to be dismissed and what happened even though that is a registered surrender deed that is of no use your law doesn't recognize such a surrender deed and what i say such a concept in the state of interest in the ancestral property and interest in the corpus property is known to the hindu law only not not known to other religion not known to muslim not to not known to christians if they surrender that that surrender deed is totally invalid exactly on this point there is one judgment of high court in this in this uh, 2021 that report in 
near Bombay reports, DBR. Okay, that's why you should be very studious, conversant about the substantive legal provisions, so provisions of substantive law. And if you are studied, well studied, you know the substantive law that it is very easy to decide a suit. And while writing judgment, now I'm coming to let's say a second or uh, other thing. You should write concisely but precisely. Concisely means shortly, precisely, clearly, short but descriptive. Concise but precise means short but descriptive. Avoid repetition. Use simple sentences. Don't use as far as possible compound sentences. Don't compound two or more sentences together. Use simple words. Use simple words and then record finding. I defer answer, find I defer answer issue number one in the affirmative. I defer answer issue number two in the negative, like this. But you above, 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 uh, against issue, your finding should be either be proved, yes. Or you may say proved. If not proved, say no. Or say not proved or disproved like this. And below that, what order and decree? Suit is decreed with cause, a suit is partly decreed with cause, a suit is dismissed with cause. Right, like, right like this. Don't write as stated below. That means again, the reader has to go to the last page of the judgment to know whether to see whether the suit is decreed or dismissed. You write there in short, suit decreed with cause, suit partly decreed with cause, a suit dismissed with cause, like this. And always you give grand cost, suit decreed with cause. Don't say suit decreed without cost. Why not without cost? Cost fall through the cause. For not awarding cost, you have to give results in the judgment. If you are not given results, that is also appealable. Suppose the suit is decreed without cost, then the plaintiff may go in appeal against not awarding of the cost and may, may argue that the lower court has not assigned any reason for not awarding the cost. Cost is the cause. Rule is to grant award cost, but the lower court has failed. Then your judgment will be criticized on this point. Avoid such criticism. That's why suit is decreed with cost, suit is dismissed with cost. Always say like this. Now, I am coming to the last part, that is the operative order of the suits. Now, one suit, now the unpaid price under section 55 of the sale of goods act, the suit is decreed with cost. The defendant do pay rupees so and so with interest at the rate of 6% per annum from the date of the suit till the realization of the money to the plaintiff. The, de the defendant shall bear his own cost. Now at the beginning, why what I said? The suit is decreed with cost. Then I get it not necessary that the defendant shall pay the cost. Not necessary. Defendant shall bear his own cost. Then decree shall be drawn accordingly. The suit for injunction. The suit is the other whatever suit is dismissed cost very easy one to one sentence when the but when the suit is decreed it is for it is for you to clarify in the judgment in the order as to how you are going to pass the decree now the suit is for injunction the suit is decreed cost. The defendant is restrained by perpetual injunction from causing obstruction to the plaintiff's position over the suit land. The defendant shall bear his own cost. Decrease shall be drawn up accordingly. Suit for specific performance contract. I am always now. I am speaking to you that the suits are decreed. I am not speaking that suits are decreed because the only one said suit is decreased cost. That's all. Nothing else is required to be returned. But the suit for specific for a contract, suit is decreed with cost. The defendant shall 
to execute the cell deed, register cell deed in the spirit of the suit and so and so. In the name of the printing, within a period of so and so, on payment of a so and so by the printing, what the payment balance consideration by the printing to him, failing which the printing may get the cell deed executed through court by executing the record. That decree shall be drawn up accordingly. Now, how did the decree be executed? It is, the execution proceeding is required to be filed. That is the cast proceeding to be filed. Notice issued to the defendant. If the defendant appears, if he then executes, raise and put. If the defendant appears and contacts but doesn't execute the circuit, the court passes an order. Then, by order, directly the plaintiff to submit the draft circuit for the purity of the court. The top cylinder is produced. Notice of the top cylinder is given to the judgment taker. Both the points are heard. If the defendant doesn't appear, judgment taker doesn't appear, the court considers, and that is to be cylinder is to be executed through court by the court commissioner. Who is the court commissioner? Generally, the superintendent or assistant superintendent of the court. He executes the cylinder for an on behalf of the judgment taker in the name of the plaintiff and and gets his register. This is the way of executing the decree. But this is not the part of your writing of judgment. Then other suit is injunction possession under section 5 of the special defect. The defend the suit is decree with power. The defendant do deliver possession of the suit land or suit property bearing survey number so and so so to the plaintiff within a period of three months from today or six months from today. Why? That time is given for the defendant to go in appeal. In appeal. Failing which, the plaintiff may get it, get this possession record by executing the decree to court. Decree shall be drawn up accordingly, like this. And finally, and that an inquiry shall be held in respect of future mean profits from the date of the suit till the delivery of question of the land by the dependent plaintiff in view of Order 20, Rule 12, 1C of the Code of Procedure. This you have to write. If you fail to, because this follows, and if you fail to write like this, that is that part is also appealable. And if the no appeal is preferred, you are then in Darkas proceeding. Or thereafter, no application for main property shall be is maintainable. Is not maintainable. And this will be because of the mistake committed by the judicial officer, not directing an inquiry for future main properties. And if you fail to write accordingly, then that will be marked in the red pen and your mark will be reducible. Take care. Okay. Then partition suit. The suit is decreed with cost. It is hereby declared that the plaintiff has one fourth share. Defend number one, two, and three each have one fourth share in the suit property. The suit property is both agricultural land and house property. Decree. In respect of the agricultural land, shall be sent to the collector for execution in view of section 54 of the Code of Procedure. See only agricultural land. And decree in respect of house property shall be executed by appointment of the court commissioner. And that court commissioner appointed by the civil court during execution proceeding. And so far as the Agricultural land is concerned, the decree is not preliminary decree, but house property is concerned, the decree is the preliminary decree. That a preliminary decree in the state of the house property shall be drawn up accordingly. You have to write like this. Okay? I think with this, you have, you have understood as to how a civil judge, judgment is to be written. Once again, I am.
I wish you all the best. I wish that you all will get through the exam and we get the posting as the Shmid Jai Jodhika in Division of Access First Class. Thank you very much. Okay. Any question? Any question? No question? Okay, I think you are satisfied. Is there anyone from the Bar Council of Martyr Goa? Hello? Good evening, sir. Good ah, evening, good evening, sir. Good evening, yes. I have concluded. On behalf of Bar, on behalf of Bar Council of Maharashtra and Goa, I express my sincere thanks to K.D. Patil, sir, for expressing his view how to write the judge, civil judgment, especially what aspects to be considered while writing the civil judgment. That is very much helpful for the candidates who are going to appear for JMFC main and as well as the other participants who have attended the lecture, they will also help what has to be considered while practicing and uh, conducting the civil trials. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay. Thank you. Good night.